in the mountains of Northwest Thailand, deep in the Golden Triangle, an extraordinary project was created in 1988 by Her Royal Highness, the Princess Srinagarindra, mother of the late and much regretted king, His Majesty King Pumipon, or Rama IX. She had long been appalled at the environmental damage caused by the shifting cultivation practiced by the impoverished hill tribe minorities who tried to eke out a living in this no-go part of the country. In particular, she drew her inspiration from the many development projects started by her son, who had replaced opium by a variety of licit crops that the market wanted to buy. But in particular, she refused to accept the apparent inevitability of the grinding poverty experienced in the area. For these denuded mountains provided only seven months of rice for the farmers and their families. They needed a magic bullet, a productive dry season crop that would allow them to purchase the five months rice that they needed to survive. For many years, this magic bullet had been opium, a product that grew well and which was quickly purchased for the international heroin market. But with opium came a raft of other criminal activities in this politically sensitive area of the country. Gun running, human trafficking, prostitution, and the scourge of drug addiction. And with all this, the dubious reputation of the Golden Triangle was born. Clearly, something had to change. It was the combination of all these factors which led the princess mother to commit herself, at the ripe old age of 88, to regenerate the forest in the area, to eradicate poverty, and to create viable economies and communities that would become truly sustainable over time. Her private secretary, Mom Rajawong Disnodidisku, better known as Kun Chai, became the secretary general of her foundation, Mei Fa Luang, or MFL for short. And he quickly set to work with an ambitious and holistic project to redevelop the Doi Tung area and its 11,000 people in a process best described today as sustainable development through social entrepreneurship. But we're getting ahead of ourselves. Kun Chai can best describe the issues he was faced with. What are the problems? And in general, the whole world, the problem is poverty and lack of opportunity. This is the key essential. You can, you talk about drugs, you talk about prostitution, you talk about uh, gun running and so on and so forth. All these things, when you drive it to the core of the issue, is poverty and lack of opportunity. No one in this world want to be a bad, bad guy. Today, this part of Thailand is blessed by nature, with crops aplenty and the Doi Tung community well-established, healthy and debt-free. Since 1988, they've gone from this to this, or to this extraordinary transformation of the forest and the watershed. So how did they do it? Antonio Costa, the retired executive director of the UN agency, the Office on Drugs and Crime, sums up the achievements. The success story of the Doi Tung project is obviously related to the way it was conceived, designed, and delivered. How they did it? They did it in a unique way. At the United Nations, and I don't want to be derogatory about my own institutions, but we are accustomed to promote a development initiative that uh, are based on ending out resources, facilities, tools, money, to communities for their development. The Doi Tung project has been able to see development from the opposite side, creating a participatory condition for the people to get themselves involved, so that the people are not any longer consumer, beneficiary first consumer then of somebody else's income, but they create their income, they save part of their income, and they invest it. Of course, all of this takes time, it's a longer term process, I would say, but it's the only one which delivers results. And it is, above all, uh, a system of uh, 
making communities participate. It is participatory, so that people feel part of the process. They are not only beneficiary of a process passively. Another striking feature of the Doitung development project is the fact that it is based on social enterprises, namely enterprises that do generate a revenue, of course, a revenue which is partly distributed and shared among those who work for them, but it generates also a surplus, a surplus that is not pocketed by individuals, by private investor, but is uh, reinvested in other social enterprises new line of activities, new technologies, or even more so into social protection. The Foundation has found it useful to look at the development challenge on three different levels. They call it the 3S model. The first S stands for survival and applies to truly impoverished communities where survival and food security are the main immediate issues. This was like Doi Tung in 1988. But more recently, it well describes the Foundation's work in neighboring Myanmar. Here, the development process provides core agricultural projects to feed the community. But at the same time, community health and education programs have been launched and basic infrastructure improved. The second S is for sufficiency, achieved when the community has reached a certain degree of strength and financial independence. Small social enterprises have been created that call for new jobs and new skills. They function in many ways like a private company. First, working with products involving traditional wisdom, they focus on what the market wants, a market-driven approach. Additionally, over time, they seek to become efficient and effective, because if not, they will never become sustainable. Finally, they become profitable, like these production centers in Doi Tung, where the profits are not paid out to shareholders, rather they are reinvested in additional social development projects. It's a virtuous circle. The end of the development journey is the third S, when the community becomes truly sustainable with the skills to produce beautiful products such as these. They're debt-free and have savings in the bank and some are now running their own businesses. But each of these steps requires programs that the communities have built with the foundation, making sure that all are fully on board. The foundation's participative approach to development makes sure that everyone in the community feels part of the solution, and that these solutions are arrived at in the village itself, not in Bangkok. And to help this process and to build trust, quick hits are defined. Steps that address immediate issues to get people on board. In Doi Tung, it was achieved by paying the workers in the community a cash salary to replant the forest. A salary higher than the one they received for growing opium. Overnight, they went from being opium growers to forestry workers. Poverty is still one of the biggest challenges uh, in, in, in the world today, and we don't have enough projects similar to what we are doing. So um, it's not a matter of, of them believing, it's a matter of being able to understand the concept and the approach and be able to implement it on the, the, the ground and make the real changes. But what happens after the forest is replanted? In Doi Tung, future value-added crops were planted at the same time as the trees ensuring that a long-term local economy in coffee and macadamia nuts was created and could be developed. One of the Foundation's directors, Kun Narong, explains. So when the project started with the objective to stop opium cultivation and to reforest the area, it was essential for local people to earn incomes that were higher than opium cultivation or growing rice in order to become sustainable in the long term. Whatever type of plants, be they native forest plants or others, we needed the local people's cooperation and participation in the implementation steps. And in our 25 years of experience, we have seen the natural forest area grow back tremendously. It used to represent about 28%, but now has grown back to cover 69% of the land. 
and the economic forest, like here, has increased to 8%. This is what we call the sustenance forest, representing 20% and is where the local people can gather forest products for food or for other uses, like bananas or bamboo. Taken together, this mixture has restored the balance of nature. But we must always emphasize the development of people more than just the cultivation of the forest, ensuring that local people have sufficient incomes and improved standards of living. Once that happens, they will leave the forest alone and it will flourish by itself. After over 28 years, coffee and macadamia still provide stable incomes for local people and the project allows us to continue our development work to the fullest. But growing substitution crops is not enough. The foundation knew that to become sustainable, it had to move beyond the farming stage. As education and on-the-job training started to have an effect, the community was able to move to the higher value-added steps involved in processing. No example is better than Deutung coffee. From growing the green bean, they have now developed their own brand of high-quality coffee roasted, blended, and packaged in this modern plant on site. Here, new jobs in roasting and blending, quality control, packaging, and logistics have been created. And the Deutung brand has been developed and promoted throughout the country. But the foundation works internationally as well. In Afghanistan, another project, a veterinary program, was established to regenerate the decimated sheep population in Balkh province and to provide an alternative to opium cultivation. Sheep mortality was reduced from over 25% to under 3% in five years. Sheep generate meat, but also wool, and wool generates thread, which can be dyed and spun before being woven into beautiful carpets. In regenerating the sheep population, they created a whole raft of downstream value-added industries and economic activities. The Foundation's participative, holistic approach worked there as well. But Mei Fa Luang is still very active, along with others, at home. Thailand, whilst being an Asian tiger, still has too many rural poor, especially in the north. Kun Chai explains why, in 2010, a major strategic move was made to help the people living along the border with Laos in Nan province. Hills around here. It's about 85% of the uh, terrain here, mountainous. If they do deforestation here, it's so much, then the land is going to be encroached because of the poverty, you see? So what happens is that the trees are gone. So the water runs over the hill into the river, bring, in, bring along the silts and whatnot into the river. And this Nan River, composed of 12,000 million cubic meters per year, which is about approximately 45% of the main river going to Bangkok. Can you imagine that the flood, the big flood in Thailand, came from here, let's say about 45%. That's why we have to come here. If we can do the uh, reforestation here and the opportunity in lives for the people to get them better off from poverty, who would encroach this land? You see, so we can get back the land to reforest the land. And that, I think, uh, it helps concerning the global warming as we are talking about the world. So the main problem here was deforestation and water management. Too much water in the rainy season and not enough in the dry. The answer was to build or repair small dams. The villagers donated their labor and the foundation provided the materials. Kun Karan explains the impact. Here, the foundation improved the irrigation system by adding a pipeline to the reservoir and created connecting ponds. In this way, the distribution of water increased the irrigated area by 50%. But the development did not stop there. We also applied the Queen's Initiative on Model Farming and the King's Initiative on Community-Based Water Management to integrate the work with the people in the area. Look at how we were able to distribute the water to the farms. Our people in Koklam and Sengaram, like others in northeastern region, have rice as their staple food. 
We were able to increase the area for rice cultivation by 56 hectares, and we raised productivity from 50 to 90 kilos per hectare. That's an 80% increase. So we have cash crops like cashew nuts, which provide downstream value-added opportunities. But also goat banks, where villagers are loaned breeding stock and repay later in kind with baby goats from the resultant litters. In this way, the goat, or equally the pig bank, shown here, can be restocked and then provide more loans to others. The donor's money never disappears. It is recycled. Others specialize in vegetables, for their own consumption, but also for the local markets. And the soil here is naturally organic. It just needs water. These communities in northern Thailand are leaving the S survival phase and embarking on S for sufficiency, as they produce, eat and sell throughout the year, generating funds to pay off their debts. But can the experience be replicated? The model developed by the foundation in Doi Tung has now been tried and tested with success in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, and in Aceh in Indonesia. Very different cultures and religions. Each time, the specific solutions were very different, but the basic development philosophy was applied with success, as Kun Narong explains. If you start with an emphasis on survival issues, such as basic livelihoods and health, then they will start to trust you. In each community, in Afghanistan, in Myanmar, and in Indonesia, we've had to face different issues. But first, we had to identify their real problems. By listening to them and learning from them, by experiencing their way of life and putting ourselves in their shoes, we were able to identify the real issues that they were facing. We avoided discussing national and local political issues, disagreements and illicit drugs. And we also refrained from involving ourselves in issues about religion, traditions and culture. The only thing that concerned us was their basic survival needs, such as food, jobs, income and health. It's then our job to allocate the resources that we have in order to fit their priorities and their way of life, in order to provide them with security of food and shelter. True freedom will be born when they have food in their stomachs and have a stable income. What's the difference between this project and others? We would work from bottom up rather than top down. Bottom up, that means wherever we're going to do the project, we would ask the communities go into the communities and ask them what are their problems, needs and wants. And then we have to work up to the top level where the central government, then we have to find the problems that can be solved, find ways and means to solve their problems. This alone doesn't work because it becomes silo. Therefore, you have to work horizontal as well. There are so many departments so each one of them have to work together horizontally. Horizontal has to go across the body, not only once, twice, three times, and even 10 times, 20 times. And furthermore, it has to be 360 degrees all together. And if you can do this, it will work. Now, the second point is, what do the people get out of it? You see, it's not you doing for yourself. Whatever you do, you have to measure, not the input-output alone. You've got to look at the outcome. You know that the last 15 years, they did about the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. Now, from this year onward, for another 15 years, it shall be SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals. Therefore, believe you me, what we're doing here, fulfill the SDG. It can be done.